This video is an overview of answering Jewish objections to Jesus, answering the basic objections that many Jews will have against belief in Jesus. So the first question we have to ask is, what is a Jew? Well, the, being a Jew means that you fulfill one of the following two criteria. One, if your mother is a Jew, or if you have a Jewish conversion. That's it. There, there are no other criteria. If you fill one of those two, then you yourself are a Jew. So, if you have a valid Jewish conversion, then you are a Jew. If your mother has a valid Jewish conversion, uh, then she is a Jew, and on, on and so forth. So, if you trace your mother's line, and anywhere up there is a woman who is a Jew, you know, mothers to mothers to mothers that way, then you are a Jew by Jewish law. And according to Jewish law, it is impossible for a Jew to become a non-Jew. So if anyone uh, in your mother's lineage ever was a Jew at any point, then you yourself are also a Jew. And because of this, Jewishness is not just a religion or an ethnicity or even just a culture or a nationality, but it's many more than these things. If you look in the upper right, you see the traditional New York Hasidic Jewish family. So these people come from Eastern European uh, Jews, Ashkenazic Jewry. They look very white and very much like European Jews. Uh, the Jews you'll see on the upper left are Yemenite Jews, who look probably a bit more like Jesus and Paul did than the uh, white European Jews. Uh, you'll see in the lower left Chinese Jews. There are converts to Judaism, like this man is a convert to Judaism. But there are actually old, uh, very old Jewish uh, settlements uh, in China, and the Chabad is somehow not allowed to tell people about them, but there, there are a small number of very indigenous Chinese Jews. There are Jews uh, on all the different continents. Um, in the lower right, you'll see black Jews. These men are more than likely converts or children of converts, but there are Jewish, black Jewish groups that go back many, many, generation, uh, many generations. On the right, uh, middle of the right, you'll see the McJunkin family, a Tennessee, a white Tennessee American family, who uh, converted to Judaism. And so, yeah, Judaism welcomes converts from all walks of life uh, and from all different uh, ethnicities and cultures. So Jewishness is not just a race because people from any race can become Jews, uh, nor is it even a nationality since people of many nationalities become Jews. But yet at the same time, it's not really a religion because a Jew can practice any religion and still remain a Jew. So Jewishness is just a bit more than the typical categories we use. Now here are the Jewish denominations. On the upper left you'll see Orthodox, that's your typical uh, very uh, theologically conservative movements. Most ultra-Orthodox, the Black Hatters, tend to be young earth creationists and tend to have a very literal view of both the Bible and rabbinic tradition. In the lower left, you'll see conservative Judaism, uh, which is actually more of a blend of Reform and Orthodox Judaism. So under conservative Judaism, uh, they view halakha, or Jewish law, as something that's a little more flexible, and they're willing to take lenient opinions in Jewish law. And so you'll have people who won't drive on the Sabbath, but are willing to uh, use electronic devices, because in the tradition there are some opinions that say it's okay. Uh, the Orthodox won't do that. The conservative also tend to have more liberal views on like social issues and also on things like biblical criticism. I've, I've read many uh, books by conservative Jewish authors. They do tend to follow the documentary hypothesis. So it's more like conservative in as far as practice, not so much as far as belief. Now, Reform Judaism is bro broke off of uh, Orthodox Judaism during the Haskalah or the Enlightenment. The idea of Reform Judaism is to break away from having the mitzvot or obligations as mandatory. They're optional. They're more like cultural observances that you observe if it makes you feel more spiritual uh, or just don't observe if it doesn't make you feel more spiritual. So you, you might say a blessing before eating a ham and cheese sandwich because you might just think the blessing makes me more spiritual but the abs abstaining from ham or from milk and meat uh, just doesn't. So that's Reform Judaism. Um, they also practice more egalitarian stuff, so there's like female rabbis, and it, reform tends to be, um, American Jews who aren't secular tend to be more in the reform category. Uh, there's Reconstructionist Judaism, 
which broke off the conservative Jewish sect. Reconstructionists, this is founded by Mordecai Kaplan originally, wanted to go for a more liberal, even than, than conservative Jews, more liberal theology. Uh, they don't believe in a personal God or in sort of divine authorship of the scriptures. Even conservatives believe in some level of divine authorship, uh, much less than the Orthodox. A Reconstructionist, it's completely human-made. Uh, God is not really personal, but more sort of like a concept invented by us. And they also deny any view of Jews and Jewish chosenness. So the idea that Jews are a chosen people, specifically apart from the other nations, you know, uh, was Bakar Banu Mikol Ha'amim, so who called us out from all the other nations, that the Reconstructionists do not have that. So those are the Reconstructionists, but they do tend to follow some of the commandments more so than the Reform do. I've heard there was a Reconstructionist wedding where they said the full, the, the Birkin Hamazon, the after uh, meal blessings. There is a humanistic Judaism where the idea is they follow the religion of secular humanism, but it's ethnic Jews who do so. So under humanistic Judaism, uh, Judaism has some cultural uh, areas and it's more of an ethnicity and a cultural thing. But theologically or metaphysically, or as far as the worldview is concerned, it's very much secular humanism. There's Karaite Judaism, which is one of the older sects of Judaism, started around the Middle Ages. They believed in scripture alone, so they denied the authority of the rabbinic oral tradition. Once upon a time, they were as numerous as the uh, Orthodox rabbinic Jews, but now there's like maybe 7,000-ish or so of them in the world. So they are an unusual sect, but still accepted as Jews. And there's these Messianic Jews, a little bit the, maybe considered by some Jews the black sheep of the family, uh, even though they tend to be more theologically orthodox and closer theologically to the Orthodox Judaism than any of the other sects I mentioned, except maybe the Karaites, possibly, maybe. Um, yeah, there are Messianic synagogues that have more of a reform style. There are some that are conservative, and there are a few that are actually extremely orthoprax, like you would confuse them for black hat Jews. I, I don't know if that's a good thing. Uh, so when we're answering Jewish objections, we're not really talking so much with Messianic, because they, at some level, believe in Jesus. Not all of them believe in Jesus as God. They tend to believe in Jesus as Messiah. Um, whether they're going to go all the way into full-blown Christian theology depends on which Messianic sect you're running. So uh, about Christians embracing or accepting Messianic Judaism, um, you realize that it could be theologically okay, or you could be accepting uh, old heresies uh, back into your belief system. So you know, some caution is warned. Um, and, and I also just have to say, it, it makes absolutely no sense the way a lot of um, secular Jews think of humanistic Judaism as Jewish and Messianic Judaism as, as not Jewish. Like, Messianic Judaism is enormously closer to Orthodox Judaism than humanistic Judaism. Like, I mean, at least the Messianics believe uh, in God and Messiah, uh, in God giving um, a Torah and in mitzvot to the Jewish people. Humanists believe in none of that and, and don't even believe in God. So... To me, this just absolutely makes no sense at all, um, and, and I think it's part of the contradiction, uh, maybe the cultural thing against sort of a cultural belief against these kinds of groups. So we have a distinction between biblical Judaism and Karaite Judaism is a little bit more like biblical Judaism, but not a, not a lot more, but a little bit more like biblical Judaism than rabbinic Judaism is. In the biblical times, there is this national law, so the law was more like uh, the American tax law, where you're not, like in America, you don't pay taxes in order to be holier and more religiously fulfilled. You pay taxes because you go to jail if you don't. Similarly in biblical Judaism, you avoid eating pork because if you do, you're going to get whipped for, for having done so. Uh, so this is like a, a legal system, a, a binding legal system with actual, the, the ability to dish out punishment. It's centered... Uh, around the temple and sacrifice. There, there was also no separation of church and state that was totally foreign to biblical Judaism. There was a centering around the temple and sacrifices. So in, so you didn't have the three times a day prayers, you had three times a day sacrifices. And people would accept uh, that the priests are doing their job, and you would also have pilgrimages. So th a few times a year during, uh, I know during Passover and Sukkot, and I forget the third time, uh, I think it was like three times a year they had festivals where 
the people in the area were required to come up to Jerusalem and it swelled to many times its own size as, as part of their observation. Uh, the idea was to follow the Moses, law of Moses according to the text, uh, not so much according to rabbinic tradition. Uh, and there's, there's good archaeological evidence of this. Um, uh, there's the agricultural and pastoral economy. Um, and, and as far as archaeological evidence, this is like if you look at the uh, injunction against cooking a, a kid in its mother's milk, you look at the archaeological evidence of it and other and surrounding cultures, uh, all the Canaanites would cook a, a kid in its mother's milk as part of a ritual, um, as part of like a fertility ritual, and this is an injunction against that. Uh, but there, there's no evidence for ancient biblical Judaism that they had ever had any separation of the two. Um, the, the economy was agricultural and pastoral, so the idea um, was to have uh, herdsmen, uh, like th those, that is how people earned their living. They were herdsmen and they were farmers. Uh, they weren't uh, clustered in these clustered areas, uh, cities, so the entire idea of minion prayer um, really wasn't part of ancient Judaism. It kind of got around in the second, uh, in, during the second temple period, but it wasn't part of Old Testament religion at all. Uh, laws were tied to the land, so like the idea is that the ger, meaning the sojourner, not the convert, but the sojourner, was bound by the same laws as the indigenous Jew. Anyone who lived in the land was required to observe the laws of Israel. Sacrifices, um, the Sabbath, circumcision. If you were going to live there, you had to follow the laws of the land uh, just as much as a born Jew. So the entire idea of a Shabbos Goy was totally foreign to biblical Judaism. Because if they're a Goy, they were not a Jew, but they're living in the land, they still have to follow all the practices. Uh, as, con consider that uh, in opposition to rabbinic Judaism, where it's based on a system of religious observances which were not part of the national law. It's centered around the local synagogue. So you have things like the Minion Prayers, the Prayer Quorum, uh, the, the going out on Shabbat to the multiple prayers, that's a big part of the culture. Uh, they follow rabbinic tradition, so there's a, all sorts of uh, injunctions uh, brought about by the rabbis that even the rabbis don't th think are biblical, but are allowed to invoke. Um, these are things like you're not allowed to have chicken with with um, milk. Uh, even the rabbis say it's not biblical, but they, they invoke it anyway, just in case someone might break something. Um, they were focused on banking and skilled craftsmen. Like I think, uh, I think Brooke Spinoza was like a, a, a created like lenses, worked with glass. That was his, his skilled trade. And the laws were tied to individual members, and so the law is binding not based on where you live so much, but based on what your ancestry is. So a Jew living way in the dis in, in the distance, uh, far away from the land of Israel, would be, would be just as bound as a Jew living in Israel. But a Gentile living in the middle of uh, a Jewish area, in the middle of Jerusalem, would not be, uh, or in any else, anywhere else in the Holy Land, would not be any more bound to the laws than, than a Gentile living anywhere else. And so you get the Shabbos Goy, and this is a view of uh, Rabbinic Judaism. Um, rabbinic Judaism is really not about the Bible. Uh, in Rabbinic Judaism and Christianity, uh, they were sort of like if you if you think of the Second Temple Judaism as like a garden with all these different plants in it. The garden gets destroyed and only two of the, the plants or trees or whatever survive um, and reproduce after themselves um, in, in separate gardens. One of the trees would be Rabbinic Judaism and the other is Christianity. So there were many more of these trees here, such as the, uh, the Essenes or the Sadducees um, and, and Hellenists. Just different different sects of Judaism, but most of them were wiped out with the destruction of the Second Temple. Uh, and after the destruction, there was a school at Yavne. So imagine if the United States was completely destroyed, and the conquerors had, uh, after destroying and enslaving the, the population of Americans, um, okay, to, to one of the political parties. I, I you know, I, let, let's say I don't even care. Let's let's say the Green Party, um, or the Democrats or Republicans or whoever. Some party is is given permission to say, okay, you're allowed to open up a university where you're allowed to teach Americanism to future generations. Um, and imagine, uh, you know, if, if it was the Democrats and they're allowed to have the school and have their own civilization called Americanism, it's going to be very different than if the Republicans were to have this one school and call it you know, normative Americanism. Uh, and so the Pharisees were one political party, and so and so with the school at Yavne, they were able to to ice to put their political ideologies into their belief as to what Judaism really is. Out of that then came the Mishnah, around 200, uh, the year 200, 
um, which is a compilation of the basic rabbinic law, uh, the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmud, then had additional discussions surrounding those types of issues in more detail. The Babylonian Talmud tends to be more normative because we have Rashi's opinion on that, and we don't have his, his opinion on the Jerusalem Talmud. We have responsa, which is all sorts of additional traditions. So ultimately, in rabbinic Judaism, the tradition of the rabbis is sovereign. It's not so much a religion of what does the Bible say, I mean, unless there's some anti-missionary trying to trick you, but but you go to yeshiva. It's about rabbinic tradition. That That's just all, all it is. Um, the Bible is really subordinate, and can only be interpreted through the lens of rabbinic tradition anyway. Uh, and an example of this is the Akna Yavan. So in the Akna Yavan, this is from the Talmud, it's taught, on that day Rabbi Eliezer brought forth every imaginable argument, but the sages did not accept any of them. Finally he said, if the halakha, that's the Jewish law, is in accordance with me, let the carob tree prove it. So sure enough, the carob tree immediately uprooted itself and moved a hundred cubits um, from its place, and he said, no, no proof can be brought from the carob tree. And so then he tries again and says, okay, let the channel of water prove it. And the water flowed backward, and nope, the sages weren't convinced. And he said, oh, if the halakha, the Jewish law is with me, let the walls of the house study prove it, and the walls start collapsing in. And then they rebuke the walls saying, no, the walls, you know, don't, don't do that. The, the walls are not uh, authoritative. And so Eliezer says, okay, so if the halakha is with me, let it be proved from heaven. And sure enough, a divine voice cried out and said, why do you dispute with Rabbi Eliezer, with whom the halakha always agrees? And Rabbi Joshua stood up and protested. He said, the Torah is not in heaven. We pay no attention to the divine voice, because long ago, on Mount Sinai, you wrote in your Torah, after the majority, one must incline. Now, if you look at Exodus 23, uh, in context, it actually says, do not go with those who do evil. Do not side with the majority so as to pervert justice. Which further proves the point of the rabbi saying, yeah, we can quote this verse out of context because we determine what it says. This isn't about what the Bible says according to its original intent. It's about what we say the Bible says and it's about what we say the law is. So the rabbinic tradition is sovereign and supreme over everything, even over God. This is rabbinic Judaism for you. So, dealing with the cultural objections here, we get a common belief that Judaism is just incompatible with belief in Jesus, and still about 66% of Jews in America believe this. There's about a third that, that believe they are congruent, and I think that's an advancement of the way it was 30 or 40 years ago, but still, 66% who believe it's not is still a huge issue considering how secular Judaism is, how most Jews would not consider Wicca to be incongruent with uh, Judaism, and that's open idolatry. So, just remember this, that Jesus and Paul were both Jews. Actually, um, there's much greater evidence that Paul was a Pharisee than there was that Jesus was a Pharisee. Um, I mean, there are conspiracy theories that try to say otherwise, but uh, it's, it's almost universally agreed upon that Paul was a Pharisee. Uh, and a Jew. And actually all the apostles of Jesus were Jews as well. And the early church was composed of Jews who still identified as Jews. So they still called themselves Jews. And in fact, there is a, a saying from, let's see, one of the church fathers, and I forget which one, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, who said that Christians, even those of Jewish descent, were not allowed to attend synagogues. Now why would he, um, maybe I think it was Christostom actually, why, now why would he have to say that in like, I don't know, uh, hundreds of years later. Um, and it's because even at that time, uh, belief in Jesus, or, or even Christianity, for a Jew was not considered idolatry. That's the best explanation of it. Now, Maimonides came uh, like a thousand years later and, and argued differently, or 1,200 years later, and argued differently. But um, in, in the earliest tradition, there's, there's good evidence that uh, Jews, Orthodox Jews, Rabbinic Jews, who believed Christianity was false, simply didn't believe the idolatry even for a Jew. The Chazal are absolutely silent about the issue. So, um, actually, the weirdest thing for the early Christians was um, how could uh, a Gentile uh, be a follower of Jesus? That was the real hard, hard issue. Not so much could a Jew believe in Jesus, but could a Gentile believe in Jesus? So here's a case in point. Um, the Rebbe, for example, um, he is a famous guy who turned Chabad into the largest missionary organization for Orthodox Judaism, the one who brought so many secular Jews into Frumkite, into like Hasidic Judaism and Frumkite, and actually a lot of converts as well. Um, I don't think his intention was to get converts, but uh, it was sort of a side effect of his mission. It just happened to produce 
a lot of converts as well. Um, and seen by he was seen by many of his followers as Messiah. Um, when he had a stroke, and I think this was in the early 90s, his, uh, his followers applied Isaiah 53, 7 to him, which is that he um, he was led like a lamb to slaughter, yet he would not open his mouth. So all of a sudden, they were, you know, they're interpreting Isaiah 53 as messianic, as much of the rabbinic tradition did. Uh, it certainly wasn't united against that. Maimonides believed it to be messianic, and they thought, yeah, it's clearly Isaiah 53, he's following it, therefore he's messiah. Uh, and even after he died, his followers prayed around his grave, hoping for his resurrection. And of course, many Jews got quite angry at this. It's like you're giving Christianity all of this, you know, all, all of this uh, arguments, all of this leverage, all of this fuel. Um, and it's because the, a lot of these beliefs that were supposed to be foreign and Christian and foreign to Judaism really weren't. They were hidden uh, in uh, Jewish tradition. As one ultra-Orthodox rabbi in the OU said, there are traditions about um, the Messiah, son of David, the triumphant Messiah, being poor and afflicted and suffering. But those sort of got squelched or, or sort of dis, um, de-emphasized because of Christian uh, potential use by Christian missionaries. So there's actually a lot more compatibility. Uh, and actually, frankly, Orthodox rabbinic Judaism is a lot closer to Christianity than the, than the, its proponents are willing to admit. Uh, and, and even so, the Lord, the Rabbi, by his most fanatical followers, had even called him Lord and God, which is ex very extreme. But uh, again, the idea of the Rabbi being God's presence on this earth actually has, uh, actually has support, even by the Rabbi himself. So here's, here's another cultural objection, is that the Jews were oppressed by the church. So the church oppressed lots of people, and not just the Jews. You know, anyone who was considered too much trouble... Uh, for the church, uh, who just was too much against the, the church tradition, like the people who denied the Trinity were just burned alive as heretics, uh, or, or strangled if they, you know, you'll, we'll confess, we won't burn you, we'll just strangle you. Um, Anabaptists, for example, when they came on the scene, like the Mennonite and Amish and Hutterites, and, and the precursors for the early Baptist church, which is more like my own tradition. Um, had been hunted down ruthlessly, not just by Catholics, but by the magisterial Protestants, the Anglican root Lutheran and Presbyterian, the Reformed groups, Calvinists, Lutherans, uh, and all of them, pretty much hunted down and executed them as people who wanted to destroy society. And so the Anabaptist average lifespan, because their baptism was public, uh, was about three months. So it was not a fun time. And you know, the church was just as nasty. Actually, it was safer to be a Jew than it was to be an Anabaptist, because Jews weren't seen quite as that seditious uh, and dangerous as Anabaptists. The canons of Trent, if you read them, are just as nasty and polemical against Protestants as anything in church documents is against the Jews. Uh, the cans of Trent just just bash Calvinism to no end and just have spare no words calling it just stuff from the pit of hell. So if you're going to be a, a, saying the church is angry against Jews, um, secondly, the New Testament itself focuses its polemical efforts against paganism rather than Judaism. As, as Luke Timothy Johnson actually writes in Among the Gentiles, that the early church and also the New Testament are, are much more focused on uh, attacking uh, paganism. They're, they're much harsher against paganism than they are against Judaism. And, and, and if you look at the prophets in the Tanakh, uh, they're, they are willing to attack their own countrymen or verbally bash their own countrymen at least as hard as the New Testament is. Uh, and also in the Middle East, the followers of rabbinic Judaism used Islamic leaders to purge the Karaite Jews, to commit genocide against the Karaite Jews, who were as widely known or there were as many Karite Jews as there were rabbinic Jews in the Middle East, but the rabbinic Jews eventually got um, the seat of power. They sort of got the influence of the, of the uh, Islamic leaders, and they used that to hunt down and butcher and wipe out the Karite Jews. It's not like Karaism just somehow uh, was numerous and just somehow faded away and disappeared. No, they were, they were murdered, and they were murdered at the behest of the rabbinic Jews. So the rabbis are just as guilty of committing a holocaust of their own um, as Jews, many of whom are, were not rabbinites, uh, were victims of, of the holocaust. So one, being a victim does not make you any more noble. Um, and secondly, I think we all have histories of being oppressed. Uh, and also after the rabbinic Jews came to, to commit genocide, to commit a holocaust against the Karaites, 
Karaites then came, fled to Europe. Uh, many of them and joined the church and then started using all the same arguments. We see in, in church history, after this thing took place, all of a sudden, and, and the Karaites moved to uh, Europe and some joined the church, then all of a sudden the church has these arguments, these Karaite arguments uh, against the rabbis, and you start getting all these like inquisitions and these uh, disputations against the Jews. Well, where did all these arguments seem to come from? They just, it's like they just appeared out of nowhere, unless the Karaites were the ones actually behind like the disputation at Paris. And, and there's good evidence of this. So it's not just like uh, there's a one time or one way, you know, the oppression runs in one direction. There's many different directions, many different victim groups, many different kinds of oppressions. And the rabbis were just as much, the rabbinic Jews were just as much perpetrators as victims of it. That, that doesn't make it right to do this to anyone. But the rabbinic Jews were on both ends of this. So Maimonides has this 13 principles of faith. And the two that, actually, a, an Orthodox Christian could affirm all 13 of them without any, any difficulty. Um, for example, Thomas Aquinas believed in not just divine unparalleled unity, but in divine simplicity, which is the absolute strongest form of yahid, or unity. And yet, at the same time, was a Trinitarian. And also the belief in God's non-corporeality is also a strongly Christian view. Like No theologically orthodox Christian believe, get, believes God to be inherently corporeal. There's a difference between uh, the Shekinah, or the glory of God, dwelling in a body versus, um, ha versus being inherently corporeal. However, 2 and 3 were not un un uh, believed... Uh, uniformly by Jews. Actually, this in some ways attacks certain sects of Judaism much more than it does Christianity. And that's why like the Torah scholars of northern France rejected Maimonides. They, they thought, no, we, we don't believe two and three. And in fact, there's other things here we don't, don't believe either. And so I just think it's interesting that you get the uh, Sidur, the liturgy of Orthodox Judaism, show it to a Christian, they'll affirm most or all of it, whereas you take it to maybe a Jew who's secular or has some connections with um, Reform Judaism, and they'll they'll think this stuff uh, translated is really terrible. And some conservative Jews prefer just reading it in Hebrew because they just don't want to mentally keep objecting to all the stuff they're reading. Whereas you you give the translated Siddur to a Christian, and they'll generally believe just about all of it. All, and there were Jewish reactions to Maimonides. Uh, and I, I give many of them. Rabbi Asher Meza has even more in his video, uh, Messianics are not heretics. So there's Rabbi uh, Isaiah ben Elijah of Trani spoke of Jewish scholars who believed in a corporeal God, and he argues those who believed in God's corporeality cannot be dismissed as heretics because some of the sages in the Talmud also possessed the belief that God was corporeal, that he was physical. The, the Ra'avid uh, says that there were greater people than Maimonides who believed in divine corporeality. Shmuel ben Mordecai from Rasai said that most Torah scholars in northern France believed that God is corporeal, that God is physical. Uh, Nachmanides expresses dismay of Torah scholars of France. Uh, that they, that they condemned Maimonides, say, for Hamada, because, they, because Maimonides denies that God possesses a former image, and most of the French Torah scholars believed that God was corporeal. Lubavitcher Rebbe himself said one can pray to a Rebbe, leader of a Hasidic house, because the Rebbe is the essence of God enclosed in the human body. This is the, the, the doctrine of, of Jesus. I mean, read Chaim Potok's The Chosen, and the description of Hasidic Jews of their Rebbe's is very much in line with Christian descriptions of Jesus, that the Rebbe in a sense, almost is God in corpor inside corporeal form. They are God's presence on earth. Um, Rabbi Abraham Ibn Dawood says that masses uh, of Jews in his time believed God to be a material being. Or uh, Yehida uh, Bedershi wrote that in previous generations, belief in God had, that, that he has a body was virtually widespread throughout all of, all of Israel. Um, Isaac ben Sheshed says while Christians believe in three, Kabbalists believe in ten, and they're going for this thing called Kabbalah, the view of God uh, emanating himself, having like ten uh, sephirot, these ten sort of manifestations of his, his being, and um, it multiplies God every bit as much as, as Trinitarianism does, uh, and it's just ad hoc to try to say, 
oh yeah, Christianity multiplies God, the Kabbalah unifies him. That's complete nonsense. As Rabbi Ben Shisha rightly says, uh, Abraham uh, <laughs> Blefia states that the Sephirot of Kabbalah is actually worse in times of divine unity than the Trinity. So it, it multiplies God and, and divides God from this Yahid unity away from it, even more so than the Trinity. So if you're going to condemn Christians for believing in the Trinity, you've got to condemn a large number of very traditional Orthodox Jews for their belief in Kabbalah, belief in the Sephira. And Rabbi Jacob the Nazarite directed different prayers to different Sephirot. So it's like, just like someone who would direct a prayer to the Son or to the Holy Spirit, uh, these rabbis have done the same thing for different Sephirot. So all of these things, these theological objections that Orthodox Jews make against Christianity, traditional Judaism, well-respected uh, Torah scholars have been guilty of all of that and more. On what basis can you condemn Jewish believers in Jesus for these doctrines when, when Orthodox rabbis in good standing have been guilty of all of that and more? I don't see it. Uh, one of the theological objections, uh, again, is the Trinity. And it's one God in three persons. That's the basic doctrine. So it's not one God and three gods or one person and three persons. There's one what, what you are, and then there's person who you are. So there's one what and three who. Um, and we, we see this in, in the Deuteronomy that um, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or as they say in the uh, Sidor, Lord our God, the Lord the one and only. Uh, and as Matthew 28 as well says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing or immersing them in the name, the singular name, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What's that name? Well, it's Yahweh. That's the one name of all three persons. So there is one name and one uh, and one God. Now one might say, look, in Deuteronomy 6, it clearly states that uh, you have not just monotheism, but you have something stronger than that. And I think I'll go the next one because here we go monotheism versus unitarianism so monotheism states there is one god and unitarianism states god is one person and these are very different beliefs so we affirm monotheism but not unitarianism monotheism is very much taught in tanakh but unitarianism is not uh deuteronomy 6 for example states that uh, you know god is one adonai achad of course, a chad can be used for complex unity as well, that um, the tabernacle is described as a chad despite uh, being composed of many pieces. Uh, the two shall become one flesh in Genesis. Again, a chad, that's one. Um, and I, I forget, there's other forms of use of a chad to indicate complex unity, many parts forming a single whole. Uh, but again, uh, Deuteronomy 6 uh, is stating, when they say God is one, this is uh, a polemic against the pagans. Uh, if this was a statement of God simply being one person or only one anything, that wouldn't make any sense um, given its, its historical context. Uh, the, the Greeks believed that Zeus was one, that he was one being. Or if you believe, uh, like in the Vedas, that there was only one anything. So that wouldn't make... Uh, Judaism in any way unique to if this was a statement that there that uh, God was only one but if you state that it means there is only one God then that's radical that's radically different than all the other religions it's not just to say that we worship God and there's other, uh, God, other gods out there but we don't worship them no it's to say there actually only is one God uh, and none of these other things are actually gods they're not worthy of worship so that's the huge distinction there um, biblically, we have very strong evidence for monotheism, but Unitarianism just doesn't show up um, in Tanakh. So we're not told uh, in, in Tanakh whether God is uh, maybe one person or three persons or a hundred persons or whatever, but we are definitely told that there is one God and, and there is no other. So we are definitely told there is monotheism. Now again, I went to Echad and we have these three proof text, one of them is uh, Zechariah 14.9, which is the end of the liturgy. Which means the Lord will be king over all the earth, and on that day the Lord will be one, and his name will be one. Uh, does this mean that uh, God, that God uh, will have a single unified name that's indivisible? No, it means that, that God's name will be the only name that's considered God, or even that God will only have one name. Uh, no, I mean, he has Hashem and Elohim uh, and other types of names. You know, I think Yanon, uh, many others. 
uh, other names of God. And it's not like these will disappear, but it means that God's name will be the only name ever worshipped. Which is, which is to say the Lord will be one. Is he not one now? No, it's that he'll be the only one ever worshipped and his name will be the only one ever worshipped. That is the meaning of saying God is one and his name is one. That is the historical context. Now we can also have a trinity, such as Dr. Craig's model. Um, he says there is one immaterial substance so richly endowed with mental faculties that it's sufficient for three persons. So God is one spiritual substance, um, like one soul with multiple centers of self-consciousness, I. So if you think of a cloud and imagine three dots in that cloud, you've got one soul, but multiple centers of I or centers of self-consciousness. One might say that the soul is identical with the center of self-consciousness, but that uh, I think is refuted pretty well by comatose people when you are put in under sedation. Um, what they do is they put a mask on you and they say, okay, count down backwards, uh, you know, 10, not, you know, or 100, 99, 98 or something, and you start counting backwards. And then the next thing you know, you're waking up, it's hours later, and they're like, ah, oh, the surgery went really well. And you say, wait, I, w I was just counting down. Well, it's because your, your center of self-consciousness is suppressed uh, at that point. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not conscious. In fact, it, it's as though uh, time just uh, collapsed on itself. So without a center of self-consciousness, you have a soul, you still have your personhood, um, and so the soul and the center of self-consciousness just aren't the same thing. There, there's a distinction between the two. And so there's no contradiction in saying God is one soul with multiple centers of self-consciousness. Another is the incarnation. And Philippians 2, 6 through 11, I think is my favorite passage. It's um, a piece of world tradition that existed before Paul uh, came on the scene. So this was believed by followers of Jesus even before Paul converted. So and it says this, it says that even though he, Jesus, was in the form of God, he did not count equality uh, with God a thing to be grasped or to be held on to. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him uh, and bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so, so here we are, Jesus, uh, who is both who both is God, but didn't, um, that's what it means to be in the form of God, but didn't consider equality with God a thing to be exploited. And we also have a, a, a distinction here between God meaning deity or being Yahweh, and God being the Father. And so we have uh, evidence of both the Incarnation and the Trinity in this pre-Pauline oral tradition. Uh, from Philippians 2, this is called the Carmen Christi. So now let's go forward. Yeah, all right. So we, we uh, have people objecting, saying, you know, God can't take on corporeal form. Again, many of the rabbis believe that God not only could take on corporeal form, but that he was corporeal. But a better model is the Shekinah, the great glory of God, uh, that was local and visible, local, visible, and it moved from place to place. So it was in space and in time, and it moved around. Not something that's beyond our sense experience. And this is God. This is part of God's substance that was physical, visible and extended and located in space and time. And the Shekinah, when it dwelt in a tabernacle, it was the focal point of worship. Uh, and when it dwelt in the temple, it was it made the temple the focal point of your worship. So you could worship thing the, the, the Shekinah is what made these objects worthy of worship. You could, you could worship toward it because you're worshiping the Shekinah. And so on the incarnation, the Shekinah is now forming the, the mind uh, of Jesus. So you, this is the hypostatic union where the Shekinah takes on, becomes the immaterial soul, uh, the immaterial substance for a human, uh, for a human body, becomes the center of self-consciousness and the mind uh, of this human body um, and it's still a human soul having been connected to a human body so we avoid Apollinarius's error um, and through this connection we have the Shekinah is uh, is the center of self-consciousness and is the mind of Jesus which of course is worthy of worship because it's the same Shekinah that the people of, of Israel also worshipped. So there's no objection here ancient Israel worshipped the Shekinah just as worshippers of Jesus equally worship the Shekinah. This isn't idolatry. This is actually the worship of God himself. And to deny worship to it, to, to deny worthiness of worship to him, to Jesus, is the same 
crime of blasphemy as denying uh, the legitimacy of worship of the Shekinah in Tanakh. So there's this objection that Jesus didn't fulfill any messianic prophecies. Um, this is actually ridiculous. You will find this among anti-missionaries who are speaking to an audience they know is ignorant of messianic prophecies. Uh, and ex because there, there's examples like Zechariah 9.9, which is considered almost everywhere in rabbinic traditions such as Talmud Bavli Sanhedrin and all sorts of other places to be thoroughly a messianic prophecy that Messiah will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And now we have uh, Jesus doing so to uh, two independent witnesses, one in Mark and one in John, where Jesus, uh, where Jesus rides into Jerusalem triumphantly on a donkey just as the prophecy says. Now, someone can quibble about, did he ride a donkey or did he ride like two animals or something like that? Uh, people can misinterpret Matthew to say that. Mark says nothing of the sort. And since Mark is our source, uh, you can complain all you want about Matthew and, and just say, yeah, let's, let's not use Matthew if you don't like Matthew. Let's, let's try Mark. And Mark, he clearly just, it's, which is the original source that Matthew would have used. Uh, Jesus just is riding a donkey and he's going into Israel. Pretty simple thing to fulfill. It has multiple independent attestation. There's very strong historical evidence to support that this actually happened in history. And there's also very strong rabbinic support to say that this is a messianic prophecy. So at least, if nothing else, we do have this as a clear messianic prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. So there is, uh, there's a second one uh, that we're going to go with, which is Isaiah 53, 5, which was considered, the Midrash and Samuel considered this to be a messianic prophecy. This is a prophecy of Messiah. And it says, He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. And yet we see with the crucifixion, Jesus was in fact pierced. And this is something that even Robert Funk, um, the Jesus seminar, actually Rabbi Michael Skoback as well says this, is a, um, who of Jews for Judaism says, this is one indisputable fact of history. The crucifixion of Jesus is absolutely undeniable. Uh, I mean, there are Muslims who will deny this for uh, just for theological reasons, but historically there just is no, there, there's no way of denying this thing on historical grounds. Uh, he was crucified. That's probably one of the most established facts of ancient history, the most best attested facts of ancient history, and the Midrash itself does attribute this or some something like this to Messiah. So we have at least two prophecies where we have extremely strong evidence that they're historical and extremely strong evidence that they are messianic from rabbinic tradition. So we've got two clear prophecies that Jesus clearly fulfilled. So the next objection is Jesus didn't fulfill all the messianic prophecies. But this is this is a total non sequitur. Like <laughs> when someone comes on the scene claiming to be Messiah, people aren't going to say, well this person hasn't yet fulfilled all of the messianic prophecies and therefore this person can't possibly be messiah that is just a total non sequitur um yeah the prophecies may be in a state of uh, not not being fulfilled but could be fulfilled um in the future um people who thought you know the, the rabbi was messiah thought he'd, be, he'd build the temple weren't going to say i'm going to wait until the rabbi himself builds the temple, then I'll believe in his messiahship. No, they believe in his messiahship and trust and trusted that in the future he would rebuild the temple. So far, it looks like he's not going to, um, but if you know if he, was, if he was individually raised from the dead, then maybe he'd, he'd be able to do that. Um, so I just have to ask then, in what way is Jesus disqualified from fulfilling the rest of the prophecies? After all, if you're an Orthodox Jew, you are already theologically committed to the position that future prophecies are capable, in principle, of being fulfilled. They are still fulfillable, all of them. All the unfulfilled prophecies can still be fulfilled. So in what, you're committed to this, so in what way is Jesus disqualified from fulfilling them? And if someone wants to take me up on it and um, create a video, sure you can send it th to me through private messages, uh, but I, I seriously doubt there is any good argument that would disqualify him in a way that wouldn't disqualify everyone else. Um, so we also have this thing, this parable of the mustard seed, where your faith, where the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, and it starts out just insanely small. It may, you know, the, 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 the like the white in your fingernails is larger than this this tiny little mustard seed. You can, I mean, the thing can fit under your fingernails. It's so, the thing is so tiny. But yet, out of out of this tiny seed 
comes an enormous, an enormous bush. And so Jesus compared his prophecy like that, that his kingdom would start very small, but very slowly, maybe over thousands of years, maybe over a hundred thousand years for all we know, would eventually envelop humanity. And we're seeing this in real time. Uh, during the first century, the ratio of the uh, evangelized to the unevangelized was way over one in 300, even at, even at the end of the first century. Whereas now it's about one in four. And so people are being reached everywhere for Jesus. People who had no idea about him. In, in fact, in, in Jeremiah, where he said that uh, in that day, people won't even have to go to their neighbor and say, no, the God of Israel, because they'll already know him. And if Jeremiah was around today, he would be amazed at how many people really do know the God of Israel. But it's thanks to the work of Jesus. So his kingdom is slowly growing. But the mistake is thinking that all of these prophecies must be fulfilled within a short period of time. And there's just no reason for that. Uh, again, I'm, I'm up for saying it could take another 10,000 years for this to be fulfilled, for Jesus to return. Um, not in any way going to suggest it'll happen soon. Uh, I hope it does. But we need to, to prepare, uh, keep on preparing for the future. God's kingdom is, is working right now just as he said, in the Messianic prophecies, are slowly being fulfilled and will be fulfilled completely at the end of time. So if we look at the traditional view of Jesus, uh, there's no gr uh, the Jesus plays no greater role in Judaism than uh, Napoleon plays in Christianity. Again, this is rabbinic Judaism. So Jesus, under this view, isn't God, he isn't Messiah, he's not some judge, he's not an angelic figure, he's not even a prophet, after all, because Rabbinic tradition is committed to the view that there are no prophets after the Great Assembly with, uh, with Hagen, Zechariah, and Malachi. That's the Great Assembly. After that, their prophecy was dead. So he wasn't even an authority. I mean, he's not even like Maimonides on Jewish law. He's nothing. And so if we can show that Jesus is more than any of these, then we can show there's a serious flaw in Rabbinic Judaism. I mean, after all, how much are you going to trust your religion who, which fails to, to pick out legitimate prophets, people who, who we have very good reason to believe our prophets. We have stronger historical evidence for Jesus' abilities and his, uh, his status as this great figure than we do of even the existence of Isaiah or Ezekiel. Or if you pick almost any Tanakh prophet, we have stronger evidence for him than we do for the, really the existence of even like Moses. And so to deny legitimate prophet, uh, to deny the existence of legitimate prophets or to for a tradition to not recognize them really t casts doubt as to how legitimate the tradition is or if it's gone off the rails. So, one of the quotes by the historical Jesus, he said, concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. This is considered by the vast majority of historical Jesus scholars, including very skeptical scholars, including atheist scholars, including the Mordecai Kaplans of New Testament scholarship, the very, very, very liberal scholars, to be an authentic saying of the historical Jesus. Because there's because the you need some explanation as to how this thing arose, and there's no way the later church would make this thing up. They believe Jesus to be God. They're not going to start saying that Jesus doesn't know something. They're not going to introduce theological problems. They might say, but concerning that day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, uh, but only the Son and the Father. They, they might have said that, but he, there's no way they're going to say, nor the Son. As part of, they're going to make that up as part of an original saying of Jesus. And so this is strong evidence that he said it, but also evidence that he placed himself on an ascending scale, above humans, above the angels, and just below the Father. So he's above not just the physical beings, but the incorporeal beings. So he's way above the prophets, he's way above Moses, he's way above Adam, way above all the other, all the other humans. And he places himself at the absolute top of the scale. So, again, if he's right, this is, this is a huge problem for rabbinic Judaism, because he, Jesus is not supposed to be anyone important. But it looks like it, Jesus saw himself as someone who's very important. Certainly not a failed zealot who thought he would just restore the kingdom. And not even as Messiah who would just uh, maybe bring about political rule to Israel. Uh, this, is, this is a much higher self-image than any of that. Uh, and secondly, here's the second uh, of these three passages. Again, these are historical sayings. And they utterly refute, like, the zealot hypothesis. Like, if any of these sayings are legitimate, then the whole hypothesis of Haim Maccabi, or of Reza Aslan, or Shmuley Bateak, goes straight out the window, because they're models. I mean, even James Tabor. Um, 
their their models of Jesus are that he just didn't think of himself as more than just a powerful political leader. And if he thought himself as a divine judge or a semi-divine judge, or even someone who's just beyond the prophets and beyond Moses, uh, their their view is just scuttled. So here's here's another uh, uh, saying by Jesus, where he speaks in parables and says a man uh, basically says that there's a man who plants the vineyard, uh, and then so he dug a pit and he hired he leased the tenants and he went away, and then he sent people to collect the rent money. So he, he he sends some servants and they kill him. Sends more servants and kills him, and more and more. Finally, he says, I, "I'll send my only son. At least they're gonna they're gonna believe in my my only son." And then they kill the son, and he and then uh, Jesus says, "What do you think that the owner's gonna do when he finds this out about the tenants?" It's like, yeah, he'll he'll kill the tenants as well, and maybe give the, the vineyard over to someone else, which is sort of a prophecy that because of the Jewish rejection of Jesus. Uh, the, the, the God's own punishment is to strip the land from Jewish rule and give it over to these unwashed Gentiles, to destroy the temple, destroy ownership of the land. And so what this also shows is Jesus' own self-image. That he, he, again, this thing is accepted even by the, the Jesus Seminar as historical. Uh, it fits all of the, I guess, all of the paradigms of a, of a first century Jewish uh, teacher, or of what the kind of parables had been like, and is unlikely to have been invented after the destruction of the temple, when the whole economy had uh, had changed. So, <laughs> this story paints Jesus again above all, not just a prophet, but above all the prophets, into this unique sense of sonship that even Moses doesn't have. So now he's above the prophets, he's above Moses, he's above everyone else above humanity, and he's the unique son of God, which is beyond anything uh, Judaism would ever reconcile. I mean, even Islam at least portrays Jesus as some sort of prophet. Rabbinic Judaism doesn't even accept him as that. But if he was even a prophet, that's a good reason to disbelieve the rabbis. It's good evidence that the rabbis are wrong. And so here's the third, and a good, and a good reason also to think that the Zelt hypothesis is inaccurate. All right, so the third saying is from Matthew 11:27. And he says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So again, this is considered very unlikely to have been made up by even very skeptical scholars. Uh, again, very skeptical, atheist scholars, again, consider this very unlikely to have been made up by the church because Jesus is considering himself unknowable. But for the post-Easter church, they consistently preach, you can know Jesus right now, right here, right now. Believe in him, pray, and, and you'll receive him, and you'll have unity with him. I mean, just, this is Paul preached this as well. You, can, you, you believe him, you can have unity with him. And here Jesus is saying, I am unknowable, which is not something they would have made up. It's dis, too dissimilar to the post-Easter beliefs. But what's he saying? He says he's so great and so exalted that no one except God the Father knows him. And no one but he knows God the Father. So again, he places himself above, above humans, above the angels, above everyone else. And in this totally unique position, would a basic, would a, a zealot who simply saw himself as someone out to conquer Israel and become king again, place himself in, in such an exalted and lofty position. Yeah, unlikely. I don't think so. This is, uh, th these are the sayings of someone who believes himself to be uh, above all of creation. And perhaps, he, and, and to be so connected with the Father that he, he's saying, he's, got, he's practically saying he's got himself to have, to be, to know the Father and yet to be unknowable by all except the Father. And so this is a crazy radical self-image. So the question is, is, is this true? Are these things um, confirmed or are they the ramblings of a madman? Well, we have good evidence for the resurrection of Jesus as well. We have the pre-Mark and Passion story, and we have 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. And 1 Corinthians 15 is another piece of oral tradition that existed, again, as almost all, uh, even the very skeptical scholars will acknowledge, existed before Paul was ever on the scene. It's a very early tradition within maybe a year and a half, if that, of the crucifixion. And it's one that Paul received 
upon his conversion, which is why he says, I delivered to you of first importance what I also received. He got this. He didn't, he didn't write this piece of oral tradition. He received this piece of oral tradition. And it goes like this, that Christ, or Messiah, died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised in the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Then he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve, then more than 500 brothers at one time, and then to James, and then to all the apostles. And so there's two other points, um, most of whom are still alive, uh, although some have fallen asleep. That's like the parenthetical reference that he adds on. And also lastly, as to when the timely born, he appeared also to me, which is also uh, Paul's additions. But except for those things, all the rest is considered to be pre-Pauline. Uh, and yet it's, it, it portrays Jesus as having died, been buried, and been raised very early on. Early on enough so that if there was uh, good evidence, like they had his body, Jesus' body, rotting in the tomb, this would be very easy to, to disprove, very easy to squash. But it shows this belief was, was here very, very early on. Um, there's no way someone like Paul could have invented it because it precedes Paul. Uh, and this is what the early believers in Jesus believed. Uh, and so we also have the pre-Mark and Passion story, which basically gives you those same things. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And, and here's the minimal facts. This is by Gary Habermas, who has read um, all of the scholarship around um, Jesus as a historical figure since the beginning of the Enlightenment scholarship, like Bauer um, and Schleiermacher, and has also gone through, uh, has read every every single historical Jesus scholar since the 70s. Like So his reading, his knowledge is probably the greatest, uh, his, his knowledge of historical Jesus scholarship is probably greater than any other human being on this planet. And, and he's written uh, two in, in secular journals to say here is what skept, secular and skeptical uh, scholars believe about Jesus. And so he gives these minimal facts. This is what even the most, again, what the very, very skeptical like atheist scholars, the Mordecai Kaplan's of New Testament scholarship, the New Testament equivalents of like Reconstructionist Judaism or Humanistic Jude Judaism scholarship or Reform Judaism scholarship would say about Jesus as a historical figure. One is that he was killed by crucifixion. Two, that he was entombed in a known location. Very few people dispute this. The entombment stories would not have had something like a, like a Sanhedrist. Uh, it wouldn't have invented him as the person who buries Jesus. They would have invented the apostles as the barriers of Jesus. And so this is very strong evidence of the entombment as historical. There's on the Sunday following his burial, the tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers. Uh, again, the, in, in Second Temple Judaism, the testimony of women was considered so worthless as to be inadmissible in court. This was a huge embarrassment to the church, and it, it was it, it, this very belief subjected the early followers of Jesus to tons of ridicule, such as by Celsus, saying, like, how, like you have women as, as the discoverers? Like, that could possibly be realistic evidence, right? But for us, this is like, this is gold. There's no way this thing is going to be made up. Something that was this difficult. Uh, they had the belief that the uh, disciples had experiences they genuinely believed to be visitations from the resurrected Jesus. Um, their transformation, again, uh, considered historically certain. As I believe Joachim Miramia said, uh, there's James, who was not a follower of Jesus before the crucifixion, became a follower of Jesus. So we have James, the brother of Jesus. Um, so if I can ask if you have a brother, um, or if you had a brother, imagine what kind of evidence you would have to receive to believe that your brother was God himself in the flesh, right? That he was like raised from the dead. Uh, he was killed, he was raised from the dead, and, and that he was like the Lord and the person you're supposed to worship, right? I know for me, I, I have I have younger brothers. Uh, yeah, that, that would require an enormous amount of evidence. Uh, I, it, would, it would be a lot. I would be very predisposed not to believe that. But that's the kind of crazy, overwhelming evidence that James had. And then there was also Paul, who was a persecutor of the church. I think of him as the first century director of Yad Lachim. Again, not something he would have made up on, on his own. Um, Paul calling himself a Pharisee was not, uh, the Pharisees were uh, not liked by the early church. Um, Especially Paul, as a persecutor of the early church, that would have caused uh, early church people to uh, fear him uh, and to, let's say, disinvite him, to, to not want to, to do with him. So 
he, by even admitting this, that he was a Pharisee and a persecutor of the church, uh, Paul was already uh, casting doubt uh, on, on, um, on his trustworthiness to the early uh, church members. So it's very unlikely, again, historically very unlikely. Almost nobody believes that he would have made this up. Um, but Paul, who was this persecutor of the church, had an experience he believed was a visitation for the resurrected Jesus. Again, this, this fact, all parts of this fact, are simply... Uh, almost universally undisputed. Uh, Paul had this religious experience. He believed he had a visitation for the resurrected Jesus. Um, and, and then seventh was the movement which proclaimed the death, burial, and resurrection and lordship of Jesus grew explosively despite having every re historical reason that it should not have done so. This movement was illegal through most of its, its first 300 years. I can't believe someone like Toby Singer who would say, yeah, people became Christians because they wanted to be Jews but didn't want to follow circumcision and, like, uh, not driving on the Sabbath or not letting a fire on the Sabbath or whatever. This is nonsense. It's much easier to, to follow even today's rabbinic injunctions. And I can I say this as someone who was Orthodox. I mean, I, I was a black hatter for a year. Um, it's much easier to do that than to follow a movement which is illegal and at any time people can bust into your house, take all your possessions, throw you in jail, possibly have you or your family killed. Um, it's safer to just be a follower of the mitzvot, as, as the book of Hebrews also says. But yet this movement, despite having every reason uh, not to grow, uh, grew explosively, despite all the persecution against it. And it, it throve on the beliefs uh, in the, the deity and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. That's the movement's, that's the movement's claims. If these things were not historical, there, there's no reason that such a movement should ever ha have gained ground, yet it did. And so there's alternative explanations to these facts, like maybe the woman went to the wrong tomb, which uh, the funny thing is even the liberal scholars like Schleiermacher shot these things down hundreds of years ago. Like if the woman went to the wrong tomb, one could easily have said, oh, here's the correct tomb later on, uh, and then just found the body of Jesus. And then this whole movement, which on this view would have been found on a lie, would then have been squashed and to, the, to everyone's, um, I mean, really to everyone's relief. Then they could have gotten back to their lives. There was one that Jesus only passed out of the cross. Uh, the problem is, is people who were crucified uh, have have been trying to t have been taken down before and given medical attention, and they still died. Most of them still died anyway. And the people in the first century would have known the difference between a Jesus who somehow uh, survived the crucifixion versus one who was raised from the dead. They they would have pitied him. They wouldn't have called Jesus the the glorious resurrected. Uh, living Lord, if he was in just terrible uh, need of medical condition and horribly scarred and wounded <coughs> and mangled. Um, there's the, the belief that the disciples stole the body, which just doesn't make sense of the disciples. It doesn't make sense of the woman being the discoverers of the tomb. They would have said that they discovered the body, not that woman discovered the body. And Paul and James would have been on the lookout for this anyway. It also doesn't... Uh, he also doesn't support the fact that uh, that this thing that this this the execution of Jesus as a criminal was so devastating for the movement. To them, it was vindication, uh, a confirmation that that they were right. They were following a false teacher, and so they wouldn't have then tried to make up some sort of resurrection, stealing the body, and then going to their deaths for it. Um, there's the belief that grave robbers, some other grave robbers, stole the body. But again. Uh, an empty tomb alone does not make people say someone was raised from the dead. Uh, it doesn't explain the, the appearances. It doesn't explain uh, Peter uh, or the, the, the uh, visions of, or the um, appearances to Paul, to the disciples, to 500 people, um, and, and definitely not to James as well. In fact, the disciples stole the body doesn't explain the woman anyway. Grave robbers doesn't explain the woman at the tomb anyway. Um, Jesus had an unknown twin brother. Uh, now, now we're starting to get into conspiracy theory territory. Like once you start positing all sorts of things that have no independent um, support for them, uh, you, you're like a conspiracy theorist saying that Jews like did 9/11. You're just, you're start, you have to make all sorts of things up in order for your theory to fit together. Um, there's Paul. There's one where Paul, a charlatan, just cooked up a whole new story about Jesus and managed to sell the apostles on it. Uh, again, this wouldn't explain the woman at the tomb. Uh, it, it wouldn't explain James. 
uh, who would have been, again, on the lookout for it. And it doesn't explain, like, Polycarp and all sorts of other people who don't portray Paul as a, as a charlatan. And that the other apostles, why would they ever go along with this? Especially to their deaths. They would have fought against it. And it would be like the early Mormon church, where we have records of all the internal fighting. So if Paul was a charlatan, we would see that. We'd have records uh, of followers of other apostles saying, yeah, Paul is a charlatan, stay away from him. Um, we have the, the theory that disciples hallucinated the appearances of Jesus, but group hallucinations do not happen. And individual hallucinations tend to, um, uh, tend to be individualistic and tend to go on longer and longer. Uh, they wouldn't just stop after 40 days. And someone like James could have hallucinations. Paul certainly wouldn't have hallucinations of Jesus. And so it doesn't explain that. It doesn't explain the woman at the tomb. So it, it, it doesn't explain a bit of the evidence. There's aliens from space that snatch the body of Jesus and create a hologram of him. I mean, this one I just made up for fun. Because it explains all the evidence, probably about as well as the uh, resurrection. Except that it's an example of a totally ad hoc hypothesis. Now we got to start positing that there is an alien race we don't have independent evidence for. Uh, that there's uh, they have these motivations to take Jesus and not tell anyone. That they have holographic technology. Right, they can go to the tomb and steal the body without any, anyone noticing. Um, that they can create holograms. The technology exists and that these, this group would have some reason to do it. We'd have to posit all sorts of additional stipulations, which we have no reason for. And that's why, like most conspiracy theories, it might fit together really well, but the, its ad hoc nature just makes it crazy and unbelievable. Um, we also have a Jewish perspective. Um, Pincus Lapid, who was this Orthodox... This guy, Pincus Lapid, um, an Orthodox Jew... Uh, had a PhD in New Testament studies, and he wrote The Resurrection of Jesus, A Jewish Perspective. And Lapid himself uh, said, uh, not just uh, in concern for the resurrection, but he said, I accept the resurrection of Jesus, not as an invention of the community of disciples, but as a historical event. So the historical evidence was so strong, it convinced probably the lead, leading Jewish scholar of Jesus, leading Jewish New Testament scholar, an Orthodox Jew, not a Christian, to believe that Jesus himself was raised from the dead. That's how strong the historical evidence is. And so, uh, in conclusion, here's what we can do. Um, we can support Jewish ministries. Like, you can become a monthly tor torchbearer at askdrbrown.org. Uh, you can support One for Israel, which is a ministry of native-born Israelis. So they've got, like, Moti and Eitan there doing apologetics videos in modern Hebrew. Like, these are Hebrew-speaking Jews. In fact, their, their school, I've heard, is uh, over half uh, native-born Israeli Jews. Like, it's a Bible college. And they said there's, all, there's over a half a million, not ha yeah, over, over a half a million uh, Jewish uh, followers of Jesus in the world today. And so this movement actually, which is way more than, say, Karai. So this, this movement has a lot going for it. In fact, there was, uh, based on those numbers, there's actually probably as many Jewish believers in Jesus as there are ultra-Orthodox Jews. So if you like Hasidic and Haredi Jews, the Jews who wear black and white, Jews who wear black hats, the, that kind of community, there's, there's almost as many Jewish believers in Jesus as there are ultra-Orthodox Jews in the world today. Um, and One for Israel helps to, to show that and, and support that, and I was surprised when I heard that. You can support a Messianic Jewish congregation, and you can tell unaffiliated and intermarried Jews about it. To sort of get them uh, kind of involved so they have a community where they can, they can believe in Jesus but also support Jewish culture. You can learn to edit Wikipedia and edit articles related to the Jewish-Christian debate as well, if you want to. Uh, we, all, we definitely uh, need Wikipedia. It's a, it's a cultural battleground, very, very heavily guarded. Um, by ideologues, so we need to add our voice to it. Or how about this, if you're Jewish and you believe in Jesus, make sure you stay plugged in to mainstream Jewish culture. This is a page I'm taking out of the, uh, actually of the gay activism playbook. Uh, if, if you, as, as, a, as a Jewish believer in Jesus, get involved in mainstream Jewish culture and allow people uh, to, to ask you, you know, people have conversations with you, they may ask you about yourself, you can casually mention that you're, you're a Jewish follower of Jesus, that you are, or like a Jewish Christian, or a Messianic Jew, or whatever. You can, uh, you don't, don't, don't like push, don't like proselytize them, but at least let them know who you are. 
Because what that does is now the idea of the Jewish believer in Jesus isn't some foreign person. It's not some part of like the them group. It's actually now part of the us group. Uh, mainstream Jews can see that there are Jewish believers in Jesus. And now Jewish believers in Jesus are uh, kind of a living reality. You, know, you have a face to that kind of a view. And it helps make uh, mainstream Jews more sympathetic to Jewish belief in Jesus. And it helps them believe that being a Jew and believing in Jesus is actually compatible. They are uh, congruent. So you can join a Jewish community center, Jewish sports leagues, or, or Jewish cultural events. And just go just as yourself, just be who you are, and just get to know people. And make that your social club. And through that, even even just by, even if you don't you don't witness to anyone, that that's fine. But you just do that, and then you will uh, you will help uh, get the Jewish world to accept uh, Jewish believers in Jesus. I mean, right now my mission is not so much getting Jews uh, Jews uh, to accept Jesus, but getting Jews to accept Jews who accept Jesus. If we can just do that. Uh, we can make a huge difference uh, in the world today. So thanks. Shalom Aleichem.